Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you and every, all of the organizers. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to try to tell you about Higgs bundles and convince you that it's a cool subject to work on. So my goal today will be, or for the mini course, will be to introduce Higgs bundles and tell you where they come from, how to work with them, uh, very hands-on, and then tomorrow try to approach some open questions that people are talking about, some things that are a bit more, maybe not too much more advanced, but from different perspectives. So how do Higgs bundles relate to other areas of maths and physics? So let me put here the plan for today in our Higgs bundles mini course. Uh, Yes. I know, I want to cover this one afterwards. Okay. All right. we'll yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't care about the plan two for too long, but I want to keep it here just to start up. So I want to first tell you about how there are many ways in which you can start approaching Higgs bundles. Higgs bundles were introduced in 87 by Nigel Hitchin. So in history here. Uh, in, back in 1987, Hitching was looking at the, something called the self-duality equation. So young Mills, young Mills, self-duality equations, and he saw that these equations there for connections on a uh, originally on a four manifold, if you reduce them to two dimensions, what you get is some objects are defined on a Riemann surface and those are Higgs bundles. So you can start approaching Higgs bundles by looking at equations and solutions. I don't want to take this perspective, but I want to take the perspective of uh, vector bundles and just how do we generalize vector bundles to put a section on them. So we're going to start with Higgs bundles uh, and vector bundles. So Higgs bundles via vector bundles. And we're going to see some examples and see some definitions, and then we're going to see how can we go from this original object that appeared in 87 to something that he also defined back in 87, which are vector Higgs bundles for complex Lie groups. So Higgs bundles, Higgs for complex semi-simple Lie groups. The next step we can try to do in the generalization of these objects that are defined for a vector bundle and now with a structure group, we can put a real group. So now we're going to look at real groups. And probably we'll do this after the break. And then finally, what we're going to do is recall one of the main tools with which we can uh, talk about Higgs bundles, which, are, which is the Hitching vibration. So it's a vibration of the moduli space of Higgs bundles that will be very useful and we're going to base most of our methods in this vibration. As I say, this is just one approach to the subject. There will be many. If you're interested, just come to me and I'll tell you what to read. Um, and do stop me if you have any questions. So what we're going to do is we're going to work on Riemann surfaces, which are compact. So I'm going to call sigma a compact. Riemann surface, and I wanted to have genus at least three. So genus, well, sorry, bigger equal than two. Two is already good. If you wanted to do what we're going to learn today for genus zero or genus one, you can do it, but you need to start putting punctures or uh, more information on this Riemann surface. So we're not going to do that, but know that it can be done. And we're going to be talking a lot about the cotangent bundle of the Riemann surface. So the cotangent bundle of the Riemann surface, we're going to call it K. Now, given those two objects, if you've heard about vector bundles over a Riemann surface, you might know that there is two invariants that label vector bundles. So let's start, uh, let's start with vector bundles. vector bundles V on sigma. So a vector bundle on the Riemann surface is an object that over each point of our, over each point of our surface, we have a vector space of some rank. So it has two invariants. It has two invariants, which are N, which is the, what we call the rank, 
And this is the dimension of the vector space, which is the fiber of the object. So it is this. The dimension of the vector space. V sub x for some x inside the Riemann surface. The other invariant, which we're not going to talk much about, but I just want to put them since their existence determines the model A space, the other invariant is the degree of a vector bundle. Degree. And if you haven't seen the degree of a bundle before, the way that I like to think about it is to think about the number of zeros that a holomorphic section has. So if you take a section, this is a bundle on the Riemann surface, a section of this vector bundle will be a map here. This is a section. And if you think of holomorphic sections, holomorphic sections will have the same number of zeros uh, with multiplicity, and that's the degree. So think about it as the number of zeros of holomorphic sections. So the first question we can ask is, can we make a model a space of these objects? I, can we put these objects together in a geometric way in which we can understand the space of those objects, getting rid of anyone that's bad? So just remember, we're going to work on a Riemann surface and the canonical bundle, and vector bundles will be our main tool. So now. Yes, holomorphic vector bundles. So we should put here, holomorphic. And we need holomorphic sections, yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so in order to define the model like space, what we need to do is we need to get rid of the objects that we don't, that are not good, and that's what we add stability for. So we consider, consider stability conditions to define the modular space. The modular space. So the stability will be the following. We say, we say a vector bundle B of degree, degree D and rank. N is, and now we're going to have different options for our stability. We're going to say that it's stable if for every sub-bundle that we have of our vector bundle, so for every sub-bundle F that I take in our vector bundle E, the degree of F, the degree of F over the rank of F is less than the degree of E over the rank of E. So the degree of E was D and the rank of E was N. We're going to say that it's semi-stable if instead of inequality, we can accept equality. So semi-stable. Yes, sub-bundle. What, sorry? E. Yes, E is V, sorry. Um, can I call it E from now? <laughs> thank you. Because F and E get better together. Um, thank you. E is V from now on. Um, so semi-stable. If for every sub-bundle of E, we have less or equal here. Um, and the last option that we can have is if not, it's not stable or semi-stable, but we can care about whether it's the direct sum of things that are themselves stable. So maybe it's not stable itself, but it's the direct sum. So we're going to say it's polystable. So polystable. If E is the direct sum of F1 plus F2 plus direct sum to FR, where each of these ones are stable with the same uh, quotient here. So for fi stable and the degree of fi over the rank of fi is equal to d over n. 
So, so that we don't have to write d over n and these quotients, from now on, what we're going to do is we're going to call this quotient uh, the slope. So the slope, the slope of a vector bundle is the degree over the rank. So all we're saying is we're going to care about sub-bundles of our vector bundle. So if I give you a bundle which has no sub-bundles, then all of these doesn't apply even, so the thing is already stable. Yes? Um, hi. hi, Nathan. How are you? Um, so the FIs are stable, but you're saying that the, 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 the slope is equal to D over N? Yes. So remember that if they were stable, we wouldn't accept this. Right. But each of these FIs are stable, so the degree the degree over the rank for each of them is the same as our original one. If we sum them all together, it wouldn't accept this inequality. But each of them independently satisfies it. Okay? So you can think about, for instance, the rank 2 bundle, which has two line bundles with the same degree over rank. That together sums, they, they don't allow our rank 2 to be stable, but independently they are themselves stable as line bundles. So line bundles, let's think of line bundles, they don't have any sub-bundle, they are stable. So using these definitions, we can define, or you can construct, the moduli space of isomorphism classes of semi-stable vector bundles. So we're going to call n of n d, and what we, can, we have to do is we have to fix the two invariants, and we have to uh, we can put this to be the moduli space of rank, of, let me put here, of isomorphism classes of semi-stable rank n degree d vector bundles. So how does this space look like? This is a space, now it's a geometric object that parametrizes all the vector bundles that have some nice condition. The nice condition being, anytime we take a sub-bundle, the, the slope of the sub-bundle is less or equal than the slope of the original one. This moduli space, let's put here, one of the main properties is that when the degree and the rank are co-prime, the space is smooth. So let me put it here. When n and d are co-prime, when the maximal common divisor, so let's just put n, d co-prime, then the space is smooth. Space is smooth. And the dimension is n squared n squared g minus 1 plus 1. Now, we can try to understand what happens when it's not smooth, but we can also try to understand uh, what happens with this space. What, what is the tangent space to this space? What is the cotangent space to this space? So let me, let me go there and let's try to understand what these objects are just so that we can get into Higgs bundles. Really what Higgs bundles will be, very soon we're going to introduce them. You think about vector bundles and you think how can we enlarge this object? What things can we add to a vector bundle that will give us more information? And one of the things you can add is a section of this bundle that has some, uh, some values in some space and those will be Higgs bundles. But before we do that, let's take the, ta the tangent space to this model space. So one thing to note, to take the tangent space, we need some uh, representative of a class. So let, and now we'll go back to V. So let V be a representative of a class in N, 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 D. And we're going to take the tangent space to this and take the tangent space, space. So the tangent space to our model space of Higgs bundle, of vector bundles with fixed rank and fixed degree, we're going to put here our V, our representative, we're taking the tangent space at a point. Now, 
what one can show is that this space is actually the first cohomology over sigma of uh, the endomorphisms of V, which are traceless. So we're taking endomorphisms of the vector bundle that we've considered originally and over the Riemann surface and we take the first cohomology. In order to do some more calculations, there's something that we're going to, be, uh, to have to remember, which is that any time you take endomorphisms of a bundle or say homomorphisms from a bundle to another, what we can think of, so let me put it here, and this also works for homomorphisms if you had a V1 and V2, so not necessarily if there are the two, is that these will be isomorphic to the product of V1, V2 dual. Okay, so anytime we think of maps that go from a bundle to another, we can also think about the product of bundles. And so here we're taking product of V with V dual itself. Now we can use third duality, sir duality, to ask what is this in terms of sections? So what happens with the zeroth cohomology? So this will be a zeroth cohomology of over sigma, and what we need to do is we need to put this dual tensor. Yes, thank you. Cheers. Um, so everyone should be, stop me whenever you see something, okay? I'm going to make a tons of mistakes, so uh, just stop me and we can, uh, we can fix everything. Hopefully it's not going to be too many. But, um, so over sigma, what we're going to do is we're going to put this dual and tensored with K. So K tensored with and zero B dual. And remember that we said this is close the parenthesis, and this we can think of it as V dual, well, V V dual, so all of this is really K tensored V tensored V dual. So we're thinking of this space, this tangent space, as maps we go from, maps from the Riemann surface to this product. And here you can start wondering, what are these sections? How, how can I think of these sections that go from the Riemann surface to this bundle? This is the line bundle and vector bundle tensor with a vector bundle. And you can think of these objects as maps from V to V tensored with K. And this is where we're heading towards. We're heading towards trying to understand maps which go, which go from uh, from a vector bundle to a vector bundle tensored with a canonical bundle. So, let's put here what we're talking about. Um, so, let me just go ahead and put the definition of what Higgs bundles are. I covered a little bit, but let me put here. Definition, a Higgs bundle a Higgs bundle on the Riemann surface, sigma is a pair E phi for E holomorphic vector bundle, so for E holomorphic vector bundle on sigma and phi. Now you can foresee where I was going to with this calculation. Phi is a map from E to E tensored with K, which is holomorphic. So this person here, this phi is what we call a Higgs field. And we can either think of the Higgs field as a map that goes from E to E tensor K, or we can think of it as a section over the Riemann surface of the endomorphisms of E tensored with K. 
So it's mapped phi inside the zeroth cohomology, so the sections over the Riemann surface of the endomorphisms of E tensored with K. So it's not too complicated for now. We have a Riemann surface. We have a vector bundles over each point. We have a vector space. And this object here, what it's doing is sending the vector space to the vector space ten tensored with K. So we could say it's a one form. It's a, an endomorphism of E with values in one forms. So let's take a look at an example and see how can we think of these objects in a, in a concrete way. You can do. So this is just so that you can, you can approach Higgs bundles, either think of them as points in the tangent space, uh, but not everyone. So in a second, when we construct the moduli space, what we're going to see, that's a good point, we're going to see the moduli space or the tangent space to uh, vector, to the moduli space of vector bundles is contained as a Zariski dense inside our moduli space. So some points won't come from there. Uh, so we're always assuming NG is No, we're not. We haven't constructed any moduli space yet. When it's co prime, yes. So when it's co prime, we're going to be able to put the moduli space there. Yeah. That's a good point. Not necessarily, and most times, the moduli space of these objects won't be smooth. And understanding the, the singular points is something that's still an open question in many cases. So, um, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so let's t take a look at an example. Example one. Actually, an example that I want to come back again and again because is the first, the the, ease, the lowest rank example that later on will give what some things, uh, what people call now the hitching component. Or if you've heard about Higgs bundles parameterizing tech Muller space, this is the component that parameterizes. And so what I want to do is I want to try to construct a Higgs bundle from what we have there. So what we have there is that we need a vector bundle and a section with values in K. So let's fix a vector bundle and try to construct a family of Higgs fields. I want to fix the vector bundle as something not too trivial, so not a line bundle. The next step is a rank two bundle. And I want to do it with the information we have already, so I'm going to use the canonical bundle. I'm going to choose the square root, and I'm going to sum it to minus the square root. So the canonical bundle has, if you haven't worked with the canonical bundle much before, canonical bundle has degree 2g minus 2, 2g minus 2, the fact that it's of even degree allows us to take square roots, which means it's, a, it's an object which squares gives us our, our k. We have, there are, there are 2 to a 2g square roots. And that's why when I fixed it here, I say, let's just fix one. You have many options, we'll just fix one. Uh, if you heard about theta characteristics or spin structures, they come also from here. So there's an object that's very useful to have. So let's just fix that vector bundle and now let's try to construct sections of these. So I'm going to have phi. Phi is a map from, v, from, uh, from E to E tensored with K. So it's a rank two object. Point-wise, it will be a matrix, a two by two matrix. So we're going to have a two by two matrix and this two by two matrix will have to go from K to the half, plus k to the minus the half to k to the half plus k to the minus the half tensored with k. So our matrix has to do that. And now if I tell you that I want it to be off diagonal, so if I want to be 0 and 0 here, whatever is here will have to be, so let me call it omega, whatever is here will have to go from k to the minus a half to k to the half to k. Remember that I said when there's something that goes from a, ma from a bundle to a bundle and a bundle, then we can look at endomorphisms. And so this omega is really a point in the zeroth cohomology, so it's a section over the Riemann surface. Now I'm going to put this one dual, and these ones I keep them the same. So k to the plus half, plus half, plus one is k squared. So this is a quadratic differential. So quadratic. 
quadratic differential. And if I put here something else, if I put here uh, something that goes here, will come from k to the half, k to the minus the half k. So it really will go from k to the minus one, k one. So it's on the trivial bundle. So I'm going to put a one. So the identity. So what we have here, this is just one option, but this option, the nice thing is that we're fixing the bundle. So for the same bundle, we have several Higgs fields. So this is a family. This is a family of rank two Higgs bundles. Parametrized. by quadratic differentials. <laughs> quadratic differentials, omega. We can put the firm values of the quadratic differential and we'll still get a, a, an example of a Higgs bundle. But in order to construct, let's keep our example there, in order to construct the model space of Higgs bundles, we need to get rid of all the non-nice objects. So the same way we were talking about hitching, introducing Higgs bundles as solutions of these equations, the solutions will be there if and only if what we have is something that's nice enough. And the nice enough will be this stability condition that we need to apply. So we're going to say, we say that a Higgs bundle, a Higgs bundle E phi, is uh, stable, so, and let me just put semi here for semi stable. And what we need to do is just go back to our definition of stability for vector bundles and don't apply to everyone because now we have a new object, we have a Higgs field, a section. So it doesn't make too much sense to apply stability to every sub bundle. We're going to only apply them the stability condition to sub bundles which are preserved by phi. So it's semi or stable itself if for every sub bundle f of the venture bundle, and now I'm going to put the, the condition on the Higgs field, so it's such that the Higgs field preserves it, so such that phi of f to preserve it means that when I apply f, I go back inside f cross k. So this is what we say preserved by the Higgs field. Preserved by phi. And for every bundle that satisfies that, now we have the stability that we know of. One has, one has that the degree of f over the rank of f is less, so less just for stable, less or equal for semi-stable than the degree of e over the rank of e. So it's just the same that we applied for the other space, but now uh, we apply it to only the things that are preserved. Once we apply this stability condition, we can define the model space of Higgs bundles, and I'm going to define the model space of Higgs bundles with an m instead of an n, it's going to depend on these two invariants, and this will be the moduli space of Higgs bundles. And here we need to put all the conditions. So isomorphism classes of semi-stable Higgs bundles E phi. which have rank and degree, n and t, okay? Let's take a look at this stability <coughs> condition and see how does it work. We're not going to do too much to, with this, I just wanted it to have it on the board so we know that there are conditions that we need to have in order to start even defining the space of objects we want to work with. Now, if we look back at this example, we can try to figure out what are the bundles that are preserved by our Higgs field. So this stability condition makes sense when there is someone that's preserved. If there's no one that's preserved, then your Higgs field is stable, just automatically stable. 
So let's put that as a remark because that will be very important for us. So remark, if the Higgs field doesn't preserve anyone, if the phi does not, doesn't preserve anyone, then E phi stable automatically. Why is this important? Because we're looking at linear algebra here. We're looking at maps from vector spaces to vector spaces. And for to have someone that is preserved, if you think about the characteristic polynomial of this object, it has to decompose because it has to decompose in a, po in a, in a polynomial for what it preserves and in a polynomial that doesn't. So note that, note that, if phi preserves some f, then as a matrix, because we're talking about matrices here, uh, then the characteristic polynomial of the Higgs field decomposes. Decomposes. And one of those components is the characteristic polynomial of phi over f. So with a component corresponding to the characteristic polynomial of phi over f. So the characteristic polynomial of phi on E and the characteristic polynomial of phi. So just keep in mind that we're talking about characteristic polynomials because we're talking about maps, which are matrices, and the characteristic polynomial will come again and again into play. And so this is telling you that whenever you are taking characteristic polynomials of Higgs fields and they don't decompose, you're automatically stable. So you're automatically actually a, a smooth point of your model space. That's a very good property to have. So It depends on what you assign your variable to be. Okay. So for us, it will be important when the variable is a section of K. Oh. But you can think of it just as a matrix. Just as, just a, formal just as a formal polynomial, yes. Determinant. Yeah, determinant of phi minus lambda times identity. Okay. Look at that one and see if it decomposes. And it goes both ways. If it decomposes, there is someone that's preserved. You know that. In, and just, we think of it point by point, just as vector spaces. If you have a matrix on a vector space, you're trying to see where there is an eigenspace being preserved. Uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay, so I want to take a look at what is preserved here. Let's just try to think. This, this, uh, this omega, let's put it with color because it's important for us, this quadratic differential here. It's any quadratic differential. So can it be that something is preserved? When omega is non-zero, so if, let's put here the first case, if omega is different than zero, actually we can't have anyone preserved because my one is sending is not sending me inside myself and the minus a half is not sending me inside myself. So if omega is different than zero, no subbundle is preserved. No subbundle is preserved. So if in this family, when omega is different than zero, it's automatically stable. But what happens when omega is zero? So let's just write it here. When omega, when omega is equal to zero, let's see what's happening here. When omega is equals to zero, this is sending us to the, so it's sending us to zero. It's just the map that is the zero map. So it's preserving the k minus half. Then k to the minus a half is preserved. So now we go back to our definition of stability and we try to figure out whether that makes our Higgs pair unstable. So we want to ask, is E phi 
for phi with omega equal to zero and stable. So we note that the degree of k to the minus a half over the rank of k to the minus a half, so the rank of k, to k is a line bundle, so the rank is just one, and the degree of k was 2g minus 2, so to the half is g minus 1, but with a negative, so 1 minus g. And our genus is at least 2, remember. So if genus is at least 2, this is negative, right? This is less than 0, which means that this is less than the degree, the degree of e over the rank of e. And why is that? Because this is the rank is 2, and the degree of e is the direct sum of a line bundle, and it's dual. So it's going to be 0. The degrees cancel out. So even if there is someone that's preserved, that someone that's preserved satisfies our condition and satisfies it with strict inequality. So this family of rank 2 Higgs bundles is stable. So it's, this is a family of rank 2 stable Higgs bundles. Stable Higgs bundles over the Riemann surface. Any questions? Okay. Yes, of course. Um, so, that's a great point because that will tell us later on, will be an example, we'll come back to that example when we define the hitching vibration. Uh, but the characteristic polynomial of that, so what is characteristic polynomial of our phi's? This is the determinant, we're doing matrices, right? Determinant of phi, minus, I'm going to put a variable, let's just call it lambda, times the identity. So when we do that, we put a minus lambda and a minus lambda, and we look at the determinant. So this times this minus this times this. So lambda square minus omega. So this is the characteristic polynomial. Omega, in principle, is not the square of anyone. If it was the square of someone, this is difference of squares, it would decompose, someone would be uh, there. So if it's zero, it decomposes, and then there's someone preserved, k to the half. If it's not zero and it's not the square of someone, then it's, uh, it's a nice object. So for, what, sorry? It could, it could be a square. It could be a square, and that would mean that there is someone preserved. So the gen there, there could be a sum not for this k, not for this vector bundle. So the generic sections, uh, the generic sections of this bundle have simple zeros. Oh. So to be, so what are we thinking about these? We're thinking of omega. Omega is a quadratic differential. It's a omega. We wrote it here. It's a section inside here. So here, this this guy here has four g has degree 4g minus 4. So this omega has 4g minus 4 zeros. And generically, this thing here has 4g minus 4 different zeros. So you can't be a square. Because if you were a square, you would need to have zeros of order 2. Um, but there are, there are omegas. There, there will be omegas that are squares, and then the bundle that is preserved is not going to be one of these line bundles. Yeah. So for now, this object doesn't have too much meaning for us, but it's a very important object because when we work on the Hitching vibration, this will be the point in the Hitching base. All we will need to do is take the characteristic polynomial and then we land in the Hitching base. So that's why we care so much about it. So I'm really yeah. In the case of omega, it's a square. Yeah. You're saying that it preserves some subbundle <coughs> of E, just not these nine bundles. Just not these nine bundles. So generically, I should probably say generically. I don't think. I think uh, the problem. Mm. Seems 
So you're wondering which subbundle is preserved? Yeah, I mean, because when you say that it's yeah. stable, you want to say that no, you, you're, you're, I, I guess you're using the fact that you have no subbundles. No subbundles that are preserved. For om when omega is different than zero. And there I'm using some genericity arguments. Um, I'm using some arguments about the fact that it's not going to be preserving anyone because it's not going to be the square. So if it were the square, you would need to check if it, even when it's the square, so if it were the square of someone, say an alpha square, you would have lambda square, you have the lambda minus alpha, lambda plus alpha. This is telling you that the two bundles that it decomposes into are dual. These are the eigenvalues, right? The two eigenspaces are dual to each other. This is what's happening in our case, but it can't be one of ours and then you're not going to be preserving any of these ones. Um, so it's worth doing the exercise, and I think there might be in the problem list some things about the stability. Uh, there are several pages in Hitchin's papers about these examples, so you might want to look at it for the details. Any other questions? Yes, uh, Nathan. So is the Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. That's the definition. Thank you. That, that's a great point. So that's the definition of square root. I should put it here. The definition of a square root of a bundle is the bundle that such that square gives us the object. Where square is tensored. Where square is tensored. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All of those powers. Yeah. Um, and really, you can uh, you can think of that as square roots of the trivial bundle. Which bundle square give me the trivial bundle, sometimes you'll be able to do it. It's very correlated to that. Once you find one, you tensor with the square root of the trivial bundle and then you have many. Yes, sorry. This matrix is two by two. It is. Yeah, it's two line bundles. But k, the k is equals to zero. It's bundle. Yeah, it's dimension oh, one sorry. line bundle. That's okay, we're Riemann surfaces. <laughs> that's okay. Yes, yes. Yeah? Yeah, we're always, but no, no, that's a good point because some matrices won't be square. And that just already tells you something. Your characteristic polynomial, if your matrix is not square, it will decompose, right? There will be a kernel. That means that for those Higgs fields where the matrix is not square, there's always someone that's preserved. Uh, if you can show that there is a kernel, there's a zero eigenspace, yeah. Okay, so I probably should let you have a break or? Yeah, sure. Yeah? Okay, so maybe we take a 15 minute break. Yeah.